scholars of our constitution who would dispense among us a great deal of knowledge with among students and scholars alike. I am certain that all of us have learned a lot uh, from these invaluable lectures that we've heard for the past five days. And today we have with us yet another scholar of the constitution, Dr. Girish Kumar, assistant professor of law in the Department of Law at the Central University of Kerala, who will talk to us about the concept of constitutional morality, its past, present, and future. A concept that was very dear to the father of our constitution and the patron saint of our university, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. And without any further ado, I would love to hand over the rostrum to Harini so that she can invite our next speaker and proceed with the program. Yes, sure, Ashwin. Thank you. I welcome all of you once again to the last day of the lecture series. And with no delay, I would love to invite Dr. Bhuneshwari Ma'am to render her warm and hearty welcome to all of us and give us a brief introduction about the esteemed speaker of the day. Over to you, Ma'am. Uh, very good afternoon, pleasant good afternoon to all. Uh, Harini, I will correct in one uh, statement what you made. This is not the last day, this is the beginning. The program is beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, Ma'am. Yes, this is actually a starting journey. Madam has initiated. Uh, I thank Radhivari Revadi, Madam, for, for first for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity because I feel very uh, uh, enthralled because uh, being part of this program. Because the feedback about the program is uh, overwhelming and definitely it has showered the greatest knowledge ever uh, we heard the glimpses of our supreme law or fundamental law of the land, the constitution of India. Uh, with this, uh, a very pleasant good afternoon to all present here, to all the participants, faculties, the authorities of the university. I welcome you all on behalf of the Tamil Nadu Dr. Ambedkar Law University and our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. N. Santosh Kumar sir. Uh, for the past one week, I am also one of the participants for this program and listening to all the lectures. I, uh, when uh, the uh, brochure was uh, uh, sent by Madam, when I saw the topics chosen by the resource person, that time itself, it had given me the impression that this program is going to be very successful. The maxim I was reminded once I saw the brochure is that recipes are like cuter. Basically, as uh, uh, law students, legal scholars, uh, law professionals, we all know the meaning of the maxim recipes are like cuter. The thing speaks for itself. The title, the topics chosen by all of our resource persons was quite exemplary. Not only the title and the Following lectures delivered by them also proved their worthiness, the content, the quality it has proved for the past one week. The Constitution of India, we know that it has been, it has been given the birth by our constitutional makers with the aim of attaining the concept of justice. And the interpretation, exploration, concealment of the concept of justice was done at different levels. Today's lecture by our learned resource person, Dr. Girish Kumar sir, who is the former HOD, Central University, Kerala, is on the topic which is always, always a topic, a topic that requires, requires more deliberation. More deliberation. Yeah. Can there be some reflections? My continuation. Clear now. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it is one of the wonderful topic, the constitutional morality. Always we talk about the conflict between the law and the morality concept. It is a topic of uh, contemporary era where we depict as the transformative constitutionalism. 
from the day in 1950 what we conceived our constitution today we are not getting the same constitution as well the recent judgments by the supreme court of india quite changed the path towards transformation because transformation is inevitable as said by lord krishna change is the only thing that cannot be changed all those changes we have accepted and we are following so to my understanding to my basic knowledge with a little knowledge about constitution i think sars lecture today will enlighten us on the it is going to explore us on the contemporary era of transformative constitutionalism and let me not waste my time by with the basic understanding of my knowledge i welcome today's resource persons dr girish kumar sir the former hod of central university kerala and he is very fortunate in this that is what i felt when madam has sent his profile a combination of uh, undergraduation in economics and law post graduation double major constitution and administrative law very few people are blissful blessed by god to get the uh, knowledge whether it is at degree level or post graduate level or phd our resource person he was very blissful that is what i felt because whatever uh, he has done it is a, it has assumed a larger relevance and great importance today we know how law and economics plays the greater role and how administrative law and constitutional law has elevated the of global constitutional law and global administrative law we know about it and also the third uh okay miss his uh, phd degree he has done the phd degree in the topic legal protection of mentally challenged people in india we know how disability rights are seeing its sunlight today it's an ex it's a, a topic of prominent importance before 20 years if you see there are no development there is no scope for development we even we have never dreamt of these type of rights would be emerging he has done the topic of uh, uh, that in his phd and apart from that uh, to add up to his credit are quite exemplary faculty of law in university of delhi for five, 10 years and he has published quite innumerable articles in national and international journals on various topics especially related to human rights i take great honor and privilege sir to welcome you uh, to shower your knowledge enlighten us on the topic taken today and definitely we are here to uh, listen to you with this short introduction i welcome all of you the registrar the controller of examination research director all hods of the department pg director faculties and all the participants for this uh, wonderful lecture series once again i thank revathi madam for providing me the opportunity for being uh, uh, one of the person uh, participating in uh, welcome address thank you madam thank you Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you ma'am, for that lovely and warm welcome and giving us a brief introduction about the topic constitutional morality as well and letting us all know about sir's achievements in the field of law. Now let's begin today's main session, the keynote lecture on uh, constitutional morality. And it's my greatest pleasure to invite Dr. Girish Kumar sir to deliver his valuable lecture to us. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Irene, uh, thank you, Madam, for that wonderful welcome address. I hope everyone can hear me well. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Because we have some technical issues in Kerala, our university side, because of the network issue. So I have requested Ashwin, one of the organizers, to present my PPT from your side. And it's a big moment of happiness for me to 
because of the sole fact that I am hearing from Dr. Revati Ma'am after almost a decade because we met in Kerala University when he was a visiting to some international event and we have spent moments of happiness along with Madam, then Rathnath Reddy sir and many other luminaries of legal studies in this country. I always cherish my moments in Kerala University with the scholarly people like Revati Ma'am and the like. So recently only in 2016 only I have joined this university, Central University of Kerala. I was in Delhi University for almost 10 years. But my days in Kerala University as a PhD student, LLM student have given me tape about my thinking process on the jurisprudential aspects of legal studies. Uh, thank you for inviting me, ma'am. It's my pleasure, sir. Very great, thanks. And ma'am has requested me to deal with some topics on constitutional law. So I was aware that I am not a big scholar in the discipline because there are stalwarts in this country deal with the different, different aspects of constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and with the human rights and jurisprudential aspects of constitutional law. However, I had some reflections on the concept of constitutional morality, especially the recent developments on the appreciation and perception on constitutional morality in the light of the decisions in recent decisions of the Supreme Court in some judgments, especially the Kerala Shabarimala Temple judgment. So when we are exposed to a question as to what is constitutional morality, is social morality, and what among these two must be properly followed and respected in an ideal system? We are in trouble. We are in confusion. Because constitutional morality and principles enshrined by the constitution of the country are always of importance. As far as the peaceful and uh, legal life of the I think he got uh, disconnected from the meeting. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, morality is very much necessary in a system to lead a life governed by rule of law. And social morality, which is the product of historical development of a society, created and developed by a value system promoted by religious and other kind of traditional beliefs, styles of life, rituals, and habits of people. So social morality also is very much important in a system. So the million dollar question is, where should we strike a balance between conscious morality and social morality? So in this situation, I wanted to search for the origin of the concept of constitutional morality or the morale of the constitution of any ideal system in brief. 
I request uh, Ashwin to move on the slide. Yes, sir. Moral of a constitution. See, constitution also is a product of social morality. Once the constitution comes into being, it gives rise to different principles and thereby creates a new morality on the basis of the constitution, which is called constitutional morality. However, the social morality of a given system is far, far older than constitution or constitutional morality. To quote Alexander Hamilton, Ashwin, what happened to our presentation? It's not moving. Uh, Any problem there? Uh, no, sir. It is presented. Can, can you see the presentation? Is the slide okay. visible to you, sir? The slide is moving. Okay. No legislative act contra the constitution can be valid. To deny this would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than its principle. Means any legislative act should be subordinate to the constitution which warrants or which which authorizes it. Any legislative act against the scheme of constitution is like a deputy going greater than the principle. That the servant is above his master. That the representatives of the people are superior to the people. So, people's power is reflected through the constitution and constitution gives the authority to the members of the legislature to enact laws to govern the people. Should I present in the meeting? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to contact him. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, sir. The audio is muted by itself. There is no action from my side. I hope it, it was some technical problem. No, now it's okay. So, starting from the concept of the morale of the constitution, it is quoted. We quote Alexander Hamilton to make it clear that. Any wing of the government, legislature, executive, or judiciary is to be viewed as the servant, and the constitution is to be moved, viewed as the master through the people. And no servant can 
act beyond the mandate of its master. That means constitution's morale should be taken care of by every act of legislature, executive, as well as judiciary. We can move to the next slide, Ashwin. The legal system of liberal democracies typically make constitutional courts the final arbiters only because of the fact that constitutional courts are made up with the, with the inherent fabric of the principles made by the constitution. Even though judges are unelected officials, any defense of their decisions as being democratic must be indirect. Judges should not be in judicial process when we teach our students. We just speak about the attributes of a good, good judge. We always say that judges should not be populist. They should not be afraid of public anger or public. They should of public appreciation. Benjamin Cardoso in his big lecture on judicial process speaks about the qualities of a judge. And it is very much explicit even now. We can see from the contemporary development of judicial acts of or activism in the country. We can very much see that it is very difficult to be a true judge. A totally unbiased, a totally independent, or a totally impartial, rational, and objective judicial functioning is the dream of every constitutional democracy. And we have, as a nation, we have witnessed fluctuating tendencies on the part of the judiciary at a point of time when it was supporting the human rights, basic rights of people in every respect. So that kind of fluctuating tendency of the judiciary must be corrected and judges should be free, free in every respect, free from control from above anything other than the constitution as well as free from any extraneous considerations of fear or favor. So we can just move on, Ashwin. A democratic community, that slide is, I think, uh, behind this. Uh, yes, sir. One slide before that. Yeah. A democratic community is one where the people are ultimately responsible for the laws by which their lives are governed. People are responsible for the laws. How sarcastic is the statement? Quite often we express our opinion in the manner that people's lives have become miserable and laws are responsible, laws of the nation are responsible for this. But here it is expressed that people are ultimately responsible for the laws by which their lives are governed. Because every system, in every system, people will get the legal system they deserve, the political government they deserve, the representative of the people they deserve. So democratic process 
or electoral process is a true exercise which directly results in legitimacy and fairness in lawmaking and indirectly result in a fair and judicious legal process. Many constitutions, however, allow or call for judges to be the final authority on what the law is. Yes, we too have learned that judiciary is the interpreter of the constitution or interpreter of the law. And judiciary is vested with the power to recognize, legitimate, legitimize, or reject a law. Judicial review is the practice whereby courts are sometimes called upon to review a law or some other official act of government to determine its constitutionality or perhaps its reasonableness, rationality, or its compatibility with fundamental principles of justice. Very important state. But how can reasonableness be tested? How can the fairness be tested? Because somebody's approach or somebody's perception over what is just and reasonable may be different from another's view. So I am reminded of the uh, statement of a famous jurist, Eldridge. Eldridge, when we, when we read judicial process, we see the statement made by Eldridge that but there is no guarantee of justice except the personality of the judge. Whatever is the amount of beauty of the law drafted, whatever is the nature of fairness in the legal and judicial procedure, the ultimate dispensation of justice is largely depending upon the ability of the judge to do justice. So there is no guarantee of justice except the personality of the judge. We can move on, Ashwin, please. Chief Justice John Marshall, I invite your attention to the statement of Chief Justice John Marshall that judiciary has no will in any case. This is actually a restriction on the power of the judiciary to go beyond what is stated in law. Judicial power is never exercised for the purpose of giving effect to the will of the judge. Always for the purpose of giving effect to the will of the legislature, or in other words, to the will of the law. So it indirectly says that the law should not be colored or altered by a judicial order. But quite often, judicial process, in the judicial process, it becomes necessary that the judges or the judicial branch of the governance is forced to go beyond law to do justice. So it is a very much delicate procedure. A judicial authority should take due care when it goes to interpret the law in a fair and just or reasonable manner, it should take all due care to ensure that their attempt to do justice by interpreting the law is not resulting in injustice. Because the line between justice and injustice is so thin just like the line between truth and the falsehood. Justice and injustice are so minutely demarcated. We can move forward, Ashwin. Morality in simple words is a code of conduct that may vary from one society to another. Very important statement. Morality as well, it will vary from Time to time also. What is, what is moral today was not 
moral yesterday and sometimes what is moral today may, may be immoral tomorrow the perception of the society about the rights of the people liberty privacy equality are all being changed for example we can see the people of third gender or the transgender are collectively coming and their rights are being recognized by now legislative judicial as well as executive bodies of the country but there was a time at which this particular section of people were treated in a very much demeaning manner their life was treated their behavior was treated as immoral or against the order of the nature at one point of time however in progressive societies now even same sex marriages are being recognized so the term morality is getting redefined and reformulated in accordance with the change happening upon the concept of liberty and privacy so constitutions of no leading nations including india has defined the term morality anywhere in its text we can never see the meaning of morality in a law book we can see it in a dictionary but what is moral and what is immoral legally speaking cannot be specifically defined because it's a dynamic concept it's a dependent variable the society moves on moral is getting changed so the term constitutional morality can be viewed as an undefined code of conduct so who is to define it the society every society is vested with the big duty to define what is constitutionally moral and what is immoral whenever required and it is a big challenge faced by every society we can move on i should over 40 years ago we have seen hla hart has thought that the question of whether morality had been influenced by law had scarcely been addressed let alone answered adequately very interesting observation hart has stated that whether the question whether morality had been influenced by law has not been answered by the society but when we look into the nature of morality and constitution we see quite often law is the product of morality morality is influenced by law but the larger is the amount of law influenced by morality because the society is possessing a morality from its very origin and laws and legal systems are of latest origin only and they are necessarily the product of the moral aspirations of the society too we have seen the natural theories in jurisprudential thinking and there is a big argument that the naturalist argue that law is derived from the nature means that people learn from the nature as to what is right and what is wrong and all principles gives rise to the thinking as to what is right and what is wrong and from nature only laws are being evolved so the question has since been taken up to some degree but there is still much work to be done on this neglected issue whether morality had been influenced by law or we can add to that or vice versa whether law has been 
influenced by morality. But the relationship of law and morality, between law and morality, is a, is a two-sided relationship. Both are independent, both are dependent variables. Okay, correlation, we can say. We can move on, Ashwin. Hart writes that legal theory should avoid commitment to controversial theories of the general status of moral judgment. Very good, very good. In the recent cases, some ju cases judiciary also, Indian judiciary also put forward some opinion that in some controversial issues, the judicial or the legal branch should avoid interfering. Shabarimala cases. A classic example in which the minority judgment you might have seen the opinion of Justice Hindu Malhotra that there is a delicate area of people's faith or their moral aspirations upon which laws or constitutional uh, uh, or legal system should not keep and interfere. It continues, we can see this lead us to one question or lead us to an inquiry about constitutional or legal morality by presuming it to be intersubjective construct of legally entrenched moral principles broadly accessible to legal minds. Legal minds means people who are civilized. In a civilized society, the same confusion we have discussed earlier about constitutional morality and legal morality when happens, people realize the importance of both and clearly they, are, they become clearly able to demarcate between the two. A matured society will very much be able to give importance to either of this, constitutional morality or legal morality, social morality, whenever required, when constitutional morality is to be given importance, it will be given that. When social morality is to be given the importance, it is given. Just like the statement you can see, what is due to the Caesar is, is and what is due to the God is to the God. It's a very important statement about politics and religion. What is due for the God is for the God. Means it should not go beyond that. And what is due for the state, Caesar means the political power is to the state. Whenever these are interlinked, whenever these are mixed up, whenever politics and religions are mixed up, it creates very bad results. It results in failure of a system. So the moral principles entrenched in a society is are reflected in the constitution in an indirect way and constitution one can say is a prism constitution is a prism through which from one side the social or traditional beliefs of people enter into it and through the other side these interests are crystallizing and coming out in a different form as modern democratic values. So Hart's observation is very much important even in the present day society where even the judiciary is confused as to what is to be properly followed. 
whether constitutional morality principles or the social morality, the beliefs or faith of the people in a given situation. We can move on, actually. Many constitutional rights are entrenched through supermajoritarian voting procedures after being rationally debated by the populace. We know that constitutional making is a big process in which discussions, cross discussions, debates, cutting and editing, everything happens. The entrenched moral provisions of a constitution form a system. So our constitution, one can say, is the product of the entrenched moral beliefs of the members in that constituent assembly directly and indirectly it represents the entrenched moral principles and beliefs of the people who had formed that constituent assembly or who elected the members of the constituent assembly so every constitution is having very much necessarily having the moral principles of the society entrenched in it that moral system is a species of political morality very important known as communities constitutional morality political morality see political morality may be varying or opposing based on the political ideology of different political parties. So when one party is selected, it means the people are accepting the moral principles of that party and rejecting the moral aspirations of the opponent party. But the system becomes, becomes more complex when a coalition party is in power. Coalition government is in power. So different, different moral principles come to play. So how to strike the balance? Here comes the importance of the constitution, which is always vested with the duty to balance or harmonize different interests. We can see in a constitutionalist community, Political morality is fused with the political institutions through which it expressed and realized. And constitution is the watcher, watchman, or, or the monitor who is ensuring that the moral principles of different political parties or ideologies or different sections of people are properly taken care of and resulting in a harmonized resulting in a harmonized kind of kind of governance very important observation okay we can move on ashwin The power failure is there, I will manage to complete within it. Yes, uh, I hope you can see our slides, sir. It's already presented. Okay, okay, I can, I can. Legal morality is often distinct from such customary social practices since many consider morals to be of universal scope. See, legal morality. So law creates a moral behavior upon you. Indian Penal court says that murder is an offense. So committing murder, you are prevented from committing murder, or you are asked not to commit murder, or you are prompted not to commit murder by the law. So law creates that morality upon you, even though it is out of the fear of punishment. You are just carrying a morale created by the law. But customary social practices also create morality, which may not always equal to the morality created by law. For example, you can see 
there are different sections of people. Sure. No section may be interested in doing violence, but quite often to protect and preserve their culture and value system, they engage in violence. Audible. Yes. yes, audible. Yes, audible, audible. Recently, there was a film, Carmen. Many of you might have seen. Carmen is a movie. Earlier, there was Asuran in the same genre. There was another movie. These movies actually depict violence. And these movies, even though depict violence, the movie makers are very much successful in making, a, making the viewers believe that violence has become necessary to protect and preserve their genuine interests. So social morality quite often advocates violence, advocates offenses, or social social morality often do not believe that a particular act is violence or offense. But legal morality cannot do that. Whatever is your 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 situation, whatever is the harm caused to, to you, you are not allowed to take law in your hand. It's different. So there is a conflict between social morality and legal morality, or we can say social moral, constitutional morality. So that social morality is of universal scope. Universal scope with varying variable rules of etiquette. Everywhere you go to every corner of the world, except in some nomadic kind of sections only, you will see people are against violence. Violence is not the not the method chosen by a civilized society. However, so, uh, this the, the some situations coming in which people just renounce that nonviolent behavior and just possess or just just embrace. A, a, a kind of belief that an amount of violence or aggression is required to protect their social morality. Just like uh, America has once remarked that uh, this war is for preserving peace. America when had waged war against Iraq and Afghanistan, it has been making a statement that this war is for peace. So very interesting and paradoxical statement. A war is waged for preserving peace. So sometimes violence is resorted to protect nonviolence. Okay. We move on. I hope uh, you are able to now decipher the difference, the minute difference between social and political morality, social and uh, constitutional morality, and the different situations in which both are important, one at a time and on another time. Okay, we can move on, Ashwin. The community's constitutional morality is a construct that ranges between conventional and critical morality. Community actually experiences through, through historic uh, actions. There is experimental school of thought in law. You will study as part of your jurisprudence paper. Historical school of jurisprudence. And you will see here is like Henry Main. Many, many, many such jurists. They say that experiences teach you what is right and what is wrong. So law is the product of experience. Oliver Holmes undoubtedly states that life of law has been experience, not logic. 
not a totally acceptable statement, but one can take it with enough value. And Benjamin Cardoso, a great supporter of precedent, previous decisions, previous experience should crystallize, should be given value for new decisions, also supports it. Life of, has, life of law has not been logic but experience. But we should develop a further advanced view that life of law should be a combination of experience and logic. A combination, a perfect blend of experience and logic. So conventional morality uh, is subjected to critical morality. So new generations in every 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 society will question some moral principles of the old generation. So the, the, that critical morality is coming into clash with conventional morality. So the task of the constitutional morality is to strike a balance between the two. It is a construct that ranges between the conventional morality and critical morality. A father can easily say his son or daughter that you don't go out of the home after 7 p.m. A son or daughter may kiss it. No, you are wrong. Children can go out after 7. But the constitutional system, when it is exposed to this question, has to strike a balance between the father and the son. The father is not making, a, making such a statement in order to control or curtail the freedom of the son, but to protect him from harm. But the son, on the other hand, may view that the father is curtailing my liberty, curtailing my freedom. So the constitutional system, constitutional morality is to interfere and clearly demarcate or clearly mention, clearly declare that whenever the security and safety of the child is in risk, the father is right. And when it is not in any risk, vice versa. So this is a challenging situation. It's only a simple example. What I have given is a simple example. You can relate this example or you can reconstruct or illustrate it with the agitations for protest, dissent, freedom of expression, speech happening in this country. And the nation states, the political executives intervention. with the form of uh, like 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 criminalization of acts committed by people you can relate with this this we has to move to minor and small examples and you have to develop the, the, them into bigger and real life situation so constitutional morality is irreducible to conventional morality it cannot be reduced to conventional morality. Constitutional morality should, it may be like a, a byproduct of conventional morality among others. Conventional moral principles also contribute to constitutional morality. But one cannot reduce constitutional morality to simply con conventional morality. Con conventional morality is one among the contributors to constitutional morality. Constitutional morality borrows from many sources. Conventions can be dominated by a majority who nonetheless make marks on the constitutional morality. Yes, a majority creates convention. And only in democratic systems, majority is democratically elected. Historically, we cannot say that all majorities were created, cre creation of any democratic process. No. Might was right at one point of time, and people who were in power had dictated the law and dictated the morality. So such conventional morality cannot 
only the basis of constitutional morality. Constitutional morality can simply borrow some good elements from them. That's all. We can move, actually. We can see constitutional morality is sources. Where does it come from? We can see constitutional politics. Very important discussions and deliberations happening in the constitution. We have mentioned constitutional assembly and the politics which formed the constitutional assembly. The politics which selected the people in the assembly. So we can see this is usually marked by increased civic mindedness and principal debate and discussion. Many people in the constituent assembly were having opposing ideological uh, affinities. So there were heated arguments for over many, many provisions in the constitution. But we know compelling and opposing ideologies only will give you new reflections and new realizations. Legal archetypes. Archetype means something old. Some laws in ancient system, not only in our system, if our constitution is not product of our system only. These are also sources of constitutional morality. It's the idea of a rule or positive law provision that operates in a way that expresses the spirit of the whole doctrine and so effectively establishes the significance of it for the entire legal enterprise. So, some expression or some salient feature of an entire system which represents the spirit of the entire system. There are such ideas and ideologies in the past. Some laws, for example, laws, even prior to the constitutions, we could see laws abolishing slavery in many systems. So, a law to abolish slavery has been totally representing the spirit of the society, that the society against slavery and servitude. Slavery and servitude. And that single provision represents the spirit of the entire system. It is a, an independent oriented system, it's a liberal system. It's a liberty oriented libertarian system. It's an egalitarian equality oriented system. Everything is represented by that single provision of abolishing slavery. So such historic kind of legal archetypes or anecdotes are also sources for constitutional morality. Then we can say collective intentionality. It is the capacity of the mind, people's mind, to represent objects and states of affairs in the world other than itself. See, it, there comes the question of identity. If I am to express my view on a particular topic, normally my identity as to who I am, whom I am, will be taking very much role having a very much big role in my opinion. But in collective intentionality, I should renounce my own identity and I should see everyone around me, around me, maybe having different identities from different backgrounds. And I should see what is the, what gives the benefit to the entire group collectively. So my ability to renounce my personal interest and to appreciate the larger interest of a group to which I am belonging is called collective intentionality. 
So constitutional morality is the product of collective intentionality of the society also. No constitution can give room or give role to every single interest of every single individual in the society. It goes for collecting the collective interest of the people and to represent it in the constitutional principles. Okay, so we move on, Arjun. Sorry, Ashwin. Dr. Ambedkar's new view on constitutional morality. A paramount reference for the forms of the constitution. Enforcing obedience to the authority acting under and within these forms, yet combined with the habit of open speech, of action subject only to definite legal control, and under unrestrained censure of those very authorities as to all their public acts, combined too with a, a perfect confidence in the bosom of every citizen amidst the bitterness of party contest that the forms of the constitution will not be less sacred in the eyes of his opponents than in his own. A big statement briefly says one's power to view the principle of humanity proclaimed and pro promoted by the constitution as the most sacred one based on free speech unrestrained control of any authoritarianism unrestrained control or censure doesn't mean that arbitrariness anarchism or one can say self-restraint, self-restraint central. So summary is just like just like uh, the French philosopher, I think Rousseau has remarked. You may remember that I totally disagree with what you say, but I will fight till my death for protecting your your right to say that. Voltaire. Yeah, Voltaire. Sorry, I always get confused about these two, Voltaire or Rousseau. <laughs> so this way, constitutional morality is the power to respect one's own freedom equally with the, that of other. You can, you can refer to constitutional assembly debates. If we go for explaining it further and further, the Single slide will take one hour. It's a big, big philosophy. And Dr. Ambedkar is an is, is an articulator of humanity, human rights, and wisdom oh, with the power of jurisprudence. We can go forward, Ashwin. Worship for morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. Natural sentiment actually is based on social morality, religious or traditional beliefs make one's natural sentiments. But constitutional morality is to be cultivated because constitution comes in on a fine morning and says people to do this and not to do that. But their natural sentiment is always in existence. So there may be clash and fight, but it is the duty of the democratic or liberal state to cultivate the, the 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 sentiment of constitutional morality also can move on actually the meaning of constitutional morality when we come to the indian constitutional scheme we can simply see compromise limits may lead to majority's rule and thus the abuse of populist majoritarian power we are reminded of bentham's utilitarian view in which the pleasure of the majority is to be the integral consideration. But here it doesn't accept, constitutional morality principle doesn't accept that principle. The majoritarian rule may also prove to be detrimental. 
abuse of populist power can happen. So constitutional morality should not be limited. Constitutional morality should not be should not be limited. Should not be promoting majoritarianism always. However, it should be understood that these constitutional limits are equally applicable to the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of the government. All branches, no doubt. Constitutional morality will be limiting majoritarian power abuse as well as it will be limiting the power by all the branches of the government. Judiciary is also a creation of the constitution and is bound to comply with the restraints prescribed by it, no doubt. In course of interpreting the constitution, in course of doing justice, judiciary should not go beyond its, its own constitutional limit. Okay, move on actually, a bit faster because we have to mind the time also. Judicial notion we can see Justice Hugo Black in Griswold versus Connecticut. Unbounded judicial creativity will make this court into a day-to-day -day constitutional convention. The courts are to be both restricting and respecting, restricting themselves within the constitution as well as respecting the constitution. And there should be judicial creativity. But with some bounds. Very, very, very problematic situation. See, we want judicial activities, activism and judicial creativity. But to what extent is the when the judicial decisions touch our beliefs, our faith, we are agitated. But when the judicial activism comes to our rescue to protect our life and liberty or our equality, we are happy. Question is whether we support judicial activism or we oppose it. The problem is we support judicial activism when it is coming to our rescue. And we oppose judicial activism when it says something which is not acceptable to us. Okay, our opposition or acceptance is purely personal. Coming to the Indian judicial approach, transformative doctrine and progressive doctrine. Justice Ramesh's remark on judiciary itself, that we the members of the judiciary exult and frolic in our emancipation from the other two organs of the state, always judiciary wants to be free from other agencies. But have we developed an alternative, con alternate constitutional morality to emancipate us from the theory of checks and balances? If judiciary is not under the, not to be under the control of other agencies, do the judiciary have? Does the judiciary have a separate? control mechanism, checks and balances within it. Robust enough to keep us, keep the judiciary in control from abusing such independence. See, when you are given liberty, it is very difficult to enjoy that liberty rationally. It is very difficult for every individual to manage his liberty rationally. So, Chalameshwar, Justice Chalameshwar asking in Nalsa versus Union of India, AR 19, AR 2014, that whether the courts are having, having any mechanism to control the independence given to themselves. We have seen some judges protesting against judiciary itself in the recent past. We can move forward. Unpredictable morality. The dissenting judgment of Justice Hindu Malhotra in the Shabrimala judgment, Indian Young Lawyers Association versus Union of India. 
we can see constitutional morality according to Justice Indu Malhotra. Constitutional morality is in a pluralistic society and secular polity would reflect that the followers of various sects have the freedom of freedom to practice their faith in accordance with the tenets of their religion. Whether you accept or reject the statement, I am not asking the question. You are just viewing the statement. It is irrelevant whether the practice is rational or logical. Notions of rationality cannot be invoked in matters of religions by courts. Dissenting judgment. The majority view was opposite. But see the statements. When it comes to religious beliefs, the judgment says that it is irrelevant whether the practice is rational or logical. <laughs> Pardon, ma'am. Any problem? No, sir. Some disturbance. You can continue. Okay. Yes, sir, some disturbance. Time is time is still 4:30, na? 4:30 only. Ah, yes, yes sir. sir. We have time till 4:30. I will wind up by 4:20, and then we will have some discussion if people are sure, having. Sir. Any yes, sir. Okay. So it is very important to note down here from the statement that the judiciary says even though it is in a minority judgment, that it is irrelevant whether the practice of religious practice is rational or logic. Notions of rationality cannot be invoked in matters of religion by courts. Whether we accept it or not is a different case. We move on. Okay. Come on, Ashwin. Next, we move to next slide is Justice Chandra Jude's opinion in the same case, majority judgment. Equality above all is a protective shield of characteristics of any form of authority. Judge comes to the state that the constitutional principle is above all. These founding principles must govern constitutional norms of morality. Constitutional morality must have a value of performance which is not subject to the Fleeting fancies of every time and age. And most importantly, last sentence is very much important. You may remember the issue in Sabarimala case was whether women of a certain age are to be permitted to enter the temple or not. Justice Malhotra, in the dissenting judgment, felt no. Women should not, women of certain age should not enter. Religious practices are not to be judged with rationality. But here, the majority says women should, women can enter because exclusionary practices, excluding women from entering in the temple, exclusionary practices are contrary to constitutional morality. So we are not, we, we cannot sim, sim, simply sit and listen and, and, and pass, pass over these because we are affected. Our religious beliefs are affected. There is a conflict, internal conflict happening inside an individual between his perception of constitutional morality on one side, his perception of his own religious or social morality on the other side. Very challenging situation, but the judgment, majority judgment has been in favor of women entry, we have seen. It said constitutional morality will judge everything. Rationality has a role in even religious practices. Okay, we move on, Ashwin. New justice ideals, we can see the way forward developed by the Supreme Court, which is otherwise known as the protagonists of justice, are very much required for a nation that is governed by a single text which was written. Even constitution shall undergo, even so, constitution shall undergo uh, reform. We want constitutional social morality to undergo reform, but even constitution and constitutional morality shall undergo reform. But reform should not be moving us, bringing us backward. It should bring us forward. However, judges, judges cannot be allowed to be lawmakers who fill in silences 
through legislative additions. There are situations in which judges have to step in to fill the gap, but they should not continue to be making laws. We shall have case where Rajasthan, the, the classic example of judgment law, but it was necessary at that point of time to prevent sexual harassment at workplace. There was no law. Only after decades of the case, there has been a law came. But it is not the daily affair. It should not be the daily affair of the judiciary in silently making laws. The addition of ideals to the structure of constitutionalism is nothing but a legislative function. We agree with that. Even big judges agree to that. Judiciary, we can move to the next slide, Ash Ashwin. Judiciary too should be made visibly accountable to the ideal of constitutional morality. Judiciary is the protector and stater of constitutional morality because it's 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 appointment as or it's 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 engagement as the interpreter of the constitution, but it also is accountable to the ideal of constitutional morality. Judiciary should focus on keeping itself away from the allegations of arbitrary exercise of its own power of judicial review. It should also focus on keeping itself away from very, very interesting statement. Arbitrary exercise of its own power of judicial review. Content power also we can see quite often. Just like the sedition law exercise uh, uh, the, the, the state just like this content contempt law is also often utilized against the criticism on judiciary so then uh, whenever judiciary is reforming itself continuous reform then only it will be able to perform the ultimate aim of the constitution to instill the spirit of the constitution among the commoners of the nation. So common man cannot be taught. He should be taught in the street. He should be taught in his through his day-to-day -day experiences of governance and welfare. All branches of government, legislature, executive, as well as judiciary, shall be minding this point that their actions or inactions are educating the common man on a daily basis about their commitment to the welfare of the people. So the importance of constitutionality, constitutional morality is not a topic which can which we can discuss in a brief hour, but we try to 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 draw our reflections. And the very important point is both the social morality and constitutional morality should be regularly reforming themselves and they will be working in a working in a correlating manner or an interdependent manner in working in tandem for the creation of a better informed and liberal democratic society. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwin, for your broad support. And Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, my I, it, listeners will be having. Uh, yes, sir. Any curry, or even if it is not a curry, one can add, add to it to supplement my own understanding on the topic. Thank you very much for the organizers yes. for having invited me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Actually, uh, the credit goes to Harini for screening the uh, presentation because she was using a laptop and I asked her to present it on behalf of me. So yeah, we have to too. thank her as well. And uh, yes, sir, as you said, uh, the, the concept of constitutional morality cannot be covered within a, a mere hour, but uh, you were successful in going over uh, the brief and the basic ideas of constitutional morality, you spoke at length about the morale of the constitution. You quoted uh, famous jurists like Aldridge, uh, like HLA Art, and Alexander Hamilton. You discussed key concepts of law and morality, and how and highlighted that how they're intimately related to each other. You went over the sources of the constitu of uh, constitutional morality, and you gave us uh, a point of view of Ambedkar's uh, opinion 
over uh, constitutional minority who himself dearly held the concept of constitutional minority keeping it in mind and saying that it is of paramount relevance to the survival and the existence of the constitution sir so furthermore i would love to thank you once again for rendering such a wonderful lecture <laughs> yes sir and um, there are a few questions sir yes, and uh, if i i suppose uh, dr elumalai was having a one question if uh, Dr. Elumali, do you have any questions, Dr. sir? I have a question with me here, sir. Uh, if put to the test, what will prevail? Constitutional morality or social morality? Uh, sir, can Hello. you hear me? Hello. Um, with no, no, actually. Yes, sir. Uh, the question uh, here is, if put to the test, what will prevail? Constitutional morality or social morality? Uh, sir, we can't hear you. Ashwin, the question is, uh, what should be for constitutional morality or social morality? Uh, the question is, what will prevail, sir? If, if put to the test, what will prevail? Definitely, constitutional morality will prevail because it is having the force of law. Something which is acceptable to social morality may not be always acceptable to law. So law has a coercive value, it will prevail. And that is what happened in Shabaribala judgment. Social morality right. was against the entry of women into the temple. But the law has made it okay, so people had to accept it. But whether it is right, it is there. It's actually a jurisprudential <laughs> yes. question. Time only, only will prove it. Okay. Good. Good question. Yes, Thank you. Yes, sir. And we have another question. Uh, what is the recourse if separation of powers or say separation of function, which is the basic structure of a constitution and rule of law is breached by the judiciary? What is the separation what is the, what is the recourse? Like, uh, what is the solution, sir, if uh, the separation of powers or any uh, or the basic structure of the constitution or the rule of law is breached by the judiciary what would be the solution how can we come out of this yeah, yeah. Yeah, very interesting That's question That's also i have sorry. seen uh, 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 an opinion uh, uh, yes sir just one minute dr uh, Elway, i'll, uh, I'll address your questions uh, just um, in a moment sir sorry i'm sorry you completed then you can you permit me i'll put some questions thank you some problem with the voice. Problem uh, with sir, the we, voice. we couldn't hear you, Dr. El Malay. No, he can, was... I, can I put the question to him or can I put it later? Yes, sir. You can put a, put forward the question. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for this general permission. Sir, uh, I listened to you. It's a very wonderful lecture. I'm a faculty working this uh, particular department, sir. I have three questions to you. I understand Please. Kerala is one of the very highly human index in our country. You have said about the conventional morality, social morality, and constitutional morality. Many a time should go in hand in hand, but there are some times it runs contrarily. One of the best example is we understand the dowry debts are happening largely in well economically developed and human index developed states like Maharashtra, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. The recent incidents in Kerala shows that it is happening unabated, particularly among the educated. So do you feel that since it doesn't have the majoritarian approval, though the constitutional morality opposes this, conventional uh, morality supports that these sort of offenses are happening once, sir. This is number one, sir. This is number one, sir. Question number one. Question number one. Since social, social since morality social, and constitutional social morality are running to contrary to data. Running to contrary to these yeah, dowry related offenses are happening. Is it? That is one, sir. Two, in Sabrimala case, you have said 
uh, I understand the constitution makes it very clear. Uh, religious rights has nothing to do with the social reform. Social reform is very much important. And there is also another exceptions like subject to public order, morality and public health. Apart from social reforms, the secularism is also very much embedded in the article 25 itself. So uh, if you go by Hindu Malgotra's opinion, religion and rationalism should not go hand in hand. Then you know about the Narayana Guru movement in the Kerala, sir. Untouchables are not, all, not at all allowed for a quite long time to enter into the temple. It should be accepted. That is number two, sir. Three, I would like to ask you a very important question. Under the banner of constitutional morality, now we have recognized the sexual autonomy of women. Sexual autonomy of women is very important. So that is why we have decriminalized adultery and uh, we have decriminalized 377. Why not a consent based? Because she is the sovereign of one, her own body. So whether we have come to a time, whether the time has come to recognize the sex workers' rights in the light of Buddha, Buddha Dev Karmas versus state of West Bengal. So these are the three questions I would like to ask you. Social morality, constitutional morality in the context of dowry death. Second one, Sabrimala, secularism and social reforms are permitted in the Article 25 itself. How can uh, Hindu Malgotra can say like this? The third one is uh, uh, sexual workers' rights under the constitutional morality, sir. I'll be very happy to uh, listen sir. to your views. Uh, Thank Ji? you for your question, sir. Uh, can you repeat the first question once more? Should I repeat the question once more in a shorter format? First, first one only, first one. First one, social morality and constitutional morality things are running contrary. The dowry dates are taking place. Is it whether my understanding is right? Okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm coming to that. First issue is we have been, like many parts of the country, uh, different types of atrocities happen to women. But in Kerala, dowry deaths are also a common phenomenon. So, dowry is a kind of social belief, part of social belief. And the question consisting question is consisting of a of a of a of a of a, of a criticism why the constitutionally awakened or socially reformed state like Kerala is not able to do away with this dowry menace. So throughout this presentation, we were trying to we were trying to. Uh, express the importance, underline the importance of constitutional morality as well as social morality. So, in the case of dowry deaths, what we see is more than social morality. It is a matter of convenience. Every, every section of... Yes, somebody is speaking. Please. Every section of... Somebody's microphone is on. That's why the problem. Every section of the society expressly come against dowry, but impliedly they are in favor of it. It is a double standard happening in Kerala or elsewhere, anywhere. Anywhere the dowry menace is there, it's a double standard. Legislature comes with law to ban dowry. See how many members of the legislative assembly could marry without accepting dowry? Could marry their children, their sisters without giving dowry? No answer. Executive is the authority to, to implement the dowry prohibition act strictly. But how many, how many, how many people in the executive i was i was very much sarcastically discussing it with my friend in civil service you people write a beautiful essay for 10 pages against dowry to pass your examination if the question is write an essay on dowry menace the man will beautifully write an essay but the next day when his name is put in the rank list he will go after the bigger and bigger bigger amount of dowry to finalize his marriage. So, 
in judiciary it is authority to authority to, to check this dowry atrocities but i can ask how many inside the judiciary is actually against this social menace actually ready to renounce this social practice in their personal case or in case of their kith and kin so this double standard this is not root deep rooted belief that creates the problem just like our so problem of social institution social beliefs it is not the deep rooted belief that creates the problem since money and wealth is involved and dowry is already attached to social status also if you see people they will they will judge judge their their status on the basis of the amount of dowry they receive in marriage for a girl for a woman her status also will be judged based on the amount of dowry she carries from her home so this not at all a problem of any deep rooted belief this is a problem of convenience purely on economic or financial considerations which virtually have become a status problem in the society it is to be destroyed not only by law with a different kind of kind of attack also people should be should be like young generation should be given given strict uh, stipulations for example if a government person is to be appointed as a government servant he should be given he should be giving an affidavit as to uh, he will not accept dowry and if at all he is accepting the he should be punished that way only one can one can stop this practice social belief is not at all the problem with dowry man my opinion second is about the shabarimala issue he has rightly remarked the woman got the opportunity to enter shabarimala enter temple and it is the victory of constitutional morality over social morality and on, on one side still people belonging to the section or downtrodden sections of the society are still not having the right to enter temple so whether it is a just fair and reasonable situation my answer is no but issues are different one is about discrimination on ground of sex another is on ground of discrimination or uh, discrimination on ground of caste creed color or something which is deep rooted which has to be step by step destroyed but we should accept that to a larger extent this untouchability and this problem of temple entry of the untouchable people have been resolved personally speaking i don't believe that by allowing entry to a temple any 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 any, any particular section is getting any emancipation emancipation is a different thing it is depending on food shelter clothing and dignified life surrounding but this is also a problem of social social uh, creation of social opportunity and social equality so that should very well come so we have to travel a long way to that third question sorry again forgot my dear uh, friend please repeat your the third part of your question sir this is about the rights of sexual workers sir this is about the yeah, rights yeah, of yeah, sexu yeah. sexual workers you have to restore sexual autonomy to women decriminalize adultery decriminalize 377 okay, okay. why not we can recognize the rights of the sexual workers when they are voluntarily undertaking why it cannot be decriminalized under article uh, my, uh, my view is at, at one or other point of time it should come see in the case of sexual minorities also we have seen transgender rights were not at all recognized for long in this society even after 70 years of independence we are now only coming with protection of their rights 
or a third column in every application in general man woman others the third column has come only after 70 years of independence and constitutional process in this country so we are still in the process of come uh, continuing continuation of that 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 thing so uh, regarding sexual autonomy of women uh, this just of time decision is a is a classic one uh, but the societal it is really the deep rooted uh, belief in the society that uh, a husband is the master of wife and wife by reason of the economic dependence or by reason of the physical subordination or social kind of physical weakness and social subordination the wife is to be under the control of the husband this is a deep rooted belief and in even in the young generation uh, there is no bigger change happening upon that belief the matrimonial offense matrimonial offenses and matrimonial issues among new generation also brings uh, this kind of this kind of practices into the life men due to the centuries old uh, belief of the male dominated society uh, is under the impression that women's freedom in every respect including sexual autonomy is the domain also or in the custody in the power of man but that will also gradually disappear i am hopeful and joseph fein uh, decision by the supreme court is a, is a lighting lamp to watch that direction thank you Thank you, thank you, sir, for elaborately explaining uh, sir, each and every questions posed by Ashwin. Uh, uh, I am also thanking him, joining you, and thanking him for patiently answering all my questions, and thanking to both of you. That is to you and Harini. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my thank you, sir. Thank you once again for your lecture. I think we can conclude with the question and answer session as uh, we've uh, come closer to the end. And I would love to invite uh, Dr. Revati to continue with. Uh, uh, ma'am, you're muted, ma'am. Thank you very much, Dr. Girish Kumar, sir, for your brilliant exposition on the entire aspects of constitutional morality. You have taken extensively the theoretical perspectives uh, and uh, you have uh, very uh, uh, nicely uh, explained about the interrelationship between uh, the uh, law and morality, and particularly the jurisprudential aspects of constitutional morality. Uh, very useful presentation you have given. Uh, really, it is a wonderful session. As uh, a last part of this uh, a particular constitutional law discipline uh, related session, it is as Bhuneshwari, uh, my learned friend, has pointed out that this is not an end of uh, the session. It is uh, uh, a first part of uh, the session uh, of a lecture series. Um, uh, definitely, uh, and uh, I uh, request all the uh, members also, and it is uh, uh, a fag end of uh, the first session, and then we are uh, uh, just uh, hand handing over uh, today uh, this uh, podium to uh, Dr. Bhuneshwari to continue uh, from tomorrow onwards on uh, faculty development program and research methodology, uh, uh, another weekday long uh, academic feast. So therefore, uh, it is not an end of uh, the session and it continues. Uh, this marathon is continuing. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Girish, for accepting our invitation. Uh, I'm uh, really happy, uh, especially as you pointed out that after seeing so many years, <laughs> and then I hope uh, this uh, academic relations will be continued uh, in between uh, the Tamil Nadu Dr. Ambedkar University and uh, Central University, Kerala. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, patience uh, uh, presentation and thank you once again. Thank you very much. Over to. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Revati, for uh, thanking <laughs> our speaker. And uh, now uh, we move on to the presentation of the summary report. And uh, I'm sure all of, all of you have, have been very patient till now. And Harini and I will try and be as quick as possible and give you a gist summary of what we've done 
in this entire lecture series. Over to you, Harini, for the first three yes. days of our lecture series. Yes, thank you, Ashwin. So we will present a precise summary of the lectures of all the six days. So to begin with, the topic for the lecture on the first day was structure of social justice and its challenges. The expert speaker of the day was Professor Paranjit Singh Jaiswal, sir, Vice Chancellor of SRM University, New Delhi. Sir began his lecture by pointing out the concept of social justice, which starts right from the preamble. Though the preamble says, we the people of India, it is seen by us as I and they. That is, I have rights and they have duties. And he described rule of law as a golden thread that, that runs through the entire constitution. Sir also drew the drew attention of the participants that India is in 144, 144th position out of 156 countries as per the World Happiness Report of 2020. And when he talked about social inequality and how reservation is not only the method of uplifting, he quoted Justice Ravindra Bhatt from Maratha reservation case that affirmative action is not just reservation, education can also be promoted. He said that the social have-nots need to be elevated from their backwards, backward status through the modem of distributive justice and affirmative action. And he concluded by saying that for any nation to grow, two factors must be taken into consideration. One is right to education and right to health of all people irrespective of their social stratification. So moving on to day two, the topic for discussion on the day two was reflections on constitutional postulates. The expert speaker of the day was Professor S.K. Bhatnagar, sir, Vice Chancellor of Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. Sir stated, uh, st st sir started with the meaning of the term postulates, that is values and ideals of constitution, which are assumed to be true. He also differentiated between jural postulates and cultural postulates and explained about postulational theory of law according to anthropological school. And so mentioned the report from the committee headed by Motilal Nehru 1928, which recognized certain postulates that are still in uh, present in our constitution. And he pointed out the sea of changes in various countries' constitutions because of them trying to shift from rule of law paradigm to morality based paradigm. And he also explained the importance of unwritten principles in the light of rulings in Rylands versus Fletcher case, etc., where judgments were based on moral and social norms. Therefore, he said that the constitution ought to be read as a moral document and flexibly by going back to its roots. And uh, he pointed out the evolution of doctrine of basic structure where Supreme Court struggled to find out the uh, cultural postulates. So finally, he concluded that the dynamic nature of Indian constitution is because of existence of postulates. And moving on to day three, the topic for discussion was Law of Sedition and Freedom of Speech. The expert speaker was Professor Madhubishi Sridhar Acharya, sir, a dean of Mahindra University, Hyderabad. And sir started his lecture by explaining about right to freedom enshrined under Article 19 as the basis of establishing democratic government. And he differentiated between subjects and citizens. Sir also rightly pointed out that the criticism against a person in power is not a criticism against government and criticism against government is not sedition. And sir, observe that liberty of thought, since not placed under fundamental rights, is absolute. And he also emphasized on the point that education is the basic prerequisite to freedom in, in a democracy. And sir also highlighted how restrictions under Article 9 can be imposed only by legislation and not by any other rules or even by judgments. And he explained the doctrine of postponement of publications and why it might be arbitrary in certain cases. Also, uh, he, uh, he explained the contradiction of how sedition is just a misdemeanor in England and where a unanimous decision is necessary. And whereas in India, that is not the case. He concluded that as empowered citizens of India, we must oppose sedition strongly to save our country and democracy. So that's it for the summary for the first three days. I now invite Ash to continue with the summary of the next three days. Over to you, Ash. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Harini, for highlighting the first three days. And I will be very quick and fly over the last uh, four days, last three days that we've had. So day four, we our speaker was Professor G.B. Reddy, the professor of law from the renowned Osmani University in Hyderabad. And the discussion was on judicial legislation, impacts and limitations. Sir began the lecture by highlighting the fact that judicial legislation is a reality and he also pointed out that the doctrine of separation of powers is not merely a utopian ideal. He spoke at length about the judicial legislation it, that evolved in the Indian context and he cited numerous cases that brought out the importance of judicial legislation. 
he expressed how judicial legislation has bridged the gap between that was created by legislature and he later discussed certain limitations and potential imbalances that were caused by judicial legislations and pointed out that there are certain lines or seema rekas in his own words that should not be transgressed and we concluded that session with a very lively question and answer session day 5 Our speaker was Professor uh, Professor V Vijay Kumar, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of NLIU Bhopal, and uh, also the former Vice Chancellor of our very own university. Our discussion was on constitutional misunderstanding, a very intriguing and interesting interesting session that we had. Sir began by highlighting the fact that the Constitution of India should not be called as a bare act, but rather the term bare text must be used because the Constitution of India is not an act passed by the Parliament or legislature, but on the contrary. it is the mandate and the aspirations of the people of india he pointed out that there are three himalayan blunders that uh, have dented the purpose of the constitution and the first blunder being that the constitution of india is the lengthiest constitution in the world the second blunder emulating from the fact that we are the lengthiest con- constitution in the world that only a marginal number of people have actually read the constitution and the third blunder also arising from the first two blunders is the fact that we have incorporated certain constitutional conventions that violate the very provisions of the constitution and these conventions were imported from countries that don't even have a written constitution that was a very interesting uh, in- interesting point that sir pointed out and furthermore he discussed various other misunderstandings of terms and concepts and highlighted various other articles sir concluded the lecture by emphasizing on the importance of comprehending the intricacies of our wonderful constitution and he encouraged all law students to pursue the same day 6 that is today we had another wonderful lecture by uh, dr girish kumar the assistant professor at uh, the department of law central university of kerala and the discussion was on constitutional morality the past present and the future sir began the lecture by emphasizing the basic ideals of the morale of the constitution and he discussed at length the key concepts of law and morality and he highlighted that how these two are intimately related sir also spoke about the sources of morality constitutional morality and sir discussed the opinion of dr b r ambedkar on constitutional morality and how he reinforced the idea and he further explained to us the true meaning of what exactly is constitutional morality furthermore sir spoke about the judicial notion of constitutional morality and concluded the lecture by expressing that the judiciary is visibly accountable to the idea of constitutional morality and that is the aspirational way forward because through the actions of the judiciary the people learn and they can improve their own life there by rendering justice to the nation at large so with that we've had a, a short summary of all the six days that uh, all of you participants have been with us we are very glad that you chose to be a part of us and i thank you so much for the same and now without any further delay i would love to invite uh, dr balaji uh, the registrar of tamil nadu dr ambedkar law university to give us the vote of thanks over to you dr balaji thank you ashwin uh, am i audible yes yes ma yes yes sir yeah thank you yeah it was uh, uh, wonderful uh, listening uh, uh, to the uh, the talk what has been given so this this point of time and uh, let me begin uh, my formal vote of thanks of this the week long uh, no six day program and uh, very good evening uh, to one and all uh, i am here proud to we amid you to propose the formal word of thanks and uh, it has to be start indeed with a great privilege to thank our honorable vice chancellor of the tamil nadu dr ambedkar law university professor dr n santosh kumar sir who is really behind the success of every program of this university he is a leading beacon who in fact instilled motivation and confidence in all of us and also guides us to the next level in the academic standards of our university he a hard working visionary as from the day one he is having a persistent thought about the upgradation of the university to the national as well as the global level 
and also wanted the students and faculty to compete with the national and the global level. Where he has given or trying to give more facilities and request to focus on various academic activities, particularly this type of online or the virtual mode of academic related programs. So he has given a full freedom for all the faculty members to go ahead with that and uh, we are seeing one such classic program today which is coming to an end and uh, as Professor Devati Madam has rightly pointed out it is not over in fact another program is going to start from tomorrow by uh, Dr. Bhuvneshri Madam uh, another FDP program so this continues the knowledge actually continues However, due to his preoccupied schedule, our honorable vice chancellor could not able to make it today. But he wanted to convey his profound thanks and his message to all who contributed for the success of this week-long program. His special thanks goes to all the highly intellectual resource persons, including Dr. Girish Kumar today who delivered a scintillating talk on the important aspects of constitutional law, which reached a large number of participants through the virtual mode. So on behalf of all, I really, I really thankful to our honorable vice chancellor, who is a guiding force towards the success of every program. It is a moment of great pleasure to thank all the resource persons because Without them, the program is, is nothing. But the intellectual things has to be flow from them and it has to reach the participants in the large number. So that transformation has to take place where actually the success lies in that part. So from the feedback, what I have given, what I got, I think include including me, because of some preoccupied, uh, I think I could not have to join all the programs, but a few other programs have joined. I have, I have the feedback on what it has got has given a wonderful, uh, a successful program where the participants have enjoyed the, the every talk which has been given by the resource persons, which was thought provoking and uh, which has given lot of scope for the researcher also to research. And that is the purpose of these programs like this. So it's really indeed happy to note that it is so successful. And uh, to really thank all the resource persons, I'm joining every one of you. Once again, it is not a repetition, but I feel honored if I'm to pronounce their names in the order of their speech. Once again, uh, to thank them. It is Professor Paramjit S. Yes, Jaiswal, Vice Chancellor, SRM University from New Delhi. Professor Madhabushi Sridhar Acharya, Dean School of Law, Bharat University, Noida. Professor G. B. Reddy, Professor of Law, Osmania University, Hyderabad. Professor B. Vijay Kumar, our, our own former Vice Chancellor, now Vice Chancellor of NLIU, Bhopal. And Dr. Girish Kumar, former HOD, Central University, Kerala. So, on behalf of Honorable Vice Chancellor, the Tamil Nadu Ambedkar Law University and the faculty members and students and the participants, I profoundly thank all the resource persons once again for their intellectual contribution towards the successful of this program. Next, it gives me a great pleasure to thank the convener, Professor Dr. Rediwar Revadi. Madam, the head of the department, Department of Constitutional Law, who is a senior professor in your university and uh, who had indeed had adorned various positions in our university like syndicate member, director of PhD studies, director of research and publication, and so on. Where Madam has conducted this program in her own style and success. Madam has got a very rich teaching and academic uh, and uh, research experience. And uh, Madam is also now the coordinator for the IQSC. And uh, Adam is very focused in getting the NAC application 
to our university and uh, working very hard for that with our team. <laughs> Madam, in spite of our busy schedule of IQSA related work, constantly being in touch with all the authorities and faculty members over mobile and see to that the program should go on in a smooth and a successful man manner. Madam, I really thank you for another wonderful program given by you and your team members. My thanks also goes to the co-conveners, Dr. Yedamalai, head of the department, Department of Human Rights and Duties Education, Dr. Manjula, Assistant Professor, Department of Constitutional Law, Mr. Jay Ganesh, Assistant Professor, Department of Constitutional Law, for being supporting Madam and taking the program to a success as a teamwork. I profoundly thank all the participants who are the real beneficiaries and who can take the message of our programs to the different levels. And I really thank them for their patience and their continued support throughout the program. Now, I have to thank my beloved students, Harini, Yen, and Ashwin, who have indeed presented the summary remarks of the sixth year program with a classic brevity and profound clarity, which is really to be appreciated. I also noted down in the course of feedback and the watching the program, they all been appreciated by the, all the resource, almost all the resource persons. And Harini uh, and Ashwin and all other students who are always studious and great winner of support for us in all our programs. And uh, they complete their given task to them in their own perfect state. No, I don't want to make much time, but I thank everyone. If I missed anyone, kindly excuse me because of the paucity of time. I don't want to prolong this. So my thanks goes. Uh, once again, I thank you one and all for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much. And I must thank you all from my end as well. Thank you, Dr. Revati, ma'am, for giving me and Ashwin this wonderful opportunity of hosting this week-long virtual series. It has been a great experience for us, ma'am. And I must also thank Ashwin for being a great co-host. And thank you all the participants for your cooperation and undivided attention for every lecture. And we are happy that we got over 300 participants every day. Thank you. And please fill in the feedback forms for all the six days to receive your certificates. Thank you. No, uh, Harini, uh, Harini, for your information, uh, we should not thank ourselves. So that is a different issue. And <laughs> if the entire chat box is filled with all of them, they have thanked you, both of you, only you guys, the real champions of this week-long uh, session. No, no, a lot of them have expressed their uh, yes. uh, humble thanks to you, Harini and uh, Ashwin. Thank you. Very Thank nice, you so much. Uh, very nice. No, no. If, 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 if I am permitted to show, uh, to say right of us. our uh, university. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 sir yes. wants to share something. Yes, ma'am. The, the presentations made by our uh, two colleagues, students, that shows that how they have deeply gone through each and every uh, lecture of this. I'm sure that will enrich your research skills in the future. That's a good futuristic leadership skills and qualities which you have acquired. Our department feels very proud about you. Uh, okay. You have acquired this research skills under the dynamic leadership of our HOD, ma'am. Madam, I am very thankful to you that you have put me as a coordinator. I'm really, frankly telling I have contributed nothing. That's your generosity. Uh, that is, is our department, our university function. What is that? <laughs> it's very thankful to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. And in fact, I would like to share in this uh, platform. Uh, I think uh, Professor G.B. Reddy, he uh, mistook, uh, I can't say mistook, but uh, uh, humorously he referred uh, Ashwin as uh, Dr. Ashwin. Uh, he, I think <laughs> by seeing his get up, <laughs> he, uh, he considered him as one of the faculty members and the, the way in which he is uh, presenting, uh, he thought that <laughs> he was. Uh, faculty member here really uh, is an appreciable yes yeah we, uh, we all wish him well uh, that uh, maybe future faculty members definitely <laughs> sir, definitely sure sure sir it'll be my honor to do that <laughs>
Sir, already yes, sir. we are seeking the appointment of uh, Ashwin for our next FDP. I told already. <laughs> oh, uh, advance book. What the? Both, yes, the combination started, yeah. sir. The chemistry between uh, Harini and uh, uh, Ashwin uh, is very. Yes, sir, uh, definitely. Harini, she has to be appreciated. Very nicely they have done, madam. Carried. Thank you. Are you all right in the simple way? Yes. Without any, uh, uh, you know, there is no. Uh, mismatch at all. Uh, nice coordination between uh, both of them. Very nicely uh, have completed the task. Thank you very much. You thank are the you, real champions. So of, once again, uh, I wholeheartedly complimenting you. Without uh, both of you's help, you know, so it is uh, very difficult to complete this task without any hurdles. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Okay. It has been a pleasure and an honor to do this. And we've learned especially a lot so much. So it is truly like a win-win situation. Yes. <laughs> quit, quit pro quo. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, and uh, yes, ma'am. So I suppose uh, we can conclude uh, our, yes. our lecture series mm. finally. And... To Dr. Girish, sir, for patiently waiting with us. <laughs> yes. Sir, Girish, yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Revati ma'am, special thanks to you for uh, inviting me to this event and uh, Balaji sir for his nice words and Kuvaneshwari ma'am also. Then exemplary work done by Ashwin and Parini. Uh, we too need this uh, genre of students uh, for our programs here. We, we, we enjoy working with them and uh, you are very much fortunate to have a nice set of students like them and the students are as well so fortunate to have uh, teachers like Revati ma'am the personification of love care and affection fees what not so i always cherish memories when she was here in kerala for some program so i hope that once this pandemic situation is over we will be able to visit uh institutions personally happy about spending time with all of you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Yes. Um, yes, ma'am. I think we can uh, wind up the session. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, final thanks once again okay, to all the participants for being with us. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Thank sir. you, sir. Yes. You may leave, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks once again to all the participants for being with us for the all, all the six days, and uh, it's been an honor to moderate for you. And uh, this, this I hope, like me, you've learned a lot from this webinar. And uh, with that, thank you once again. I hope you'll be a part of TNDA uh, lecture series once again. Right, ma'am. With that, I end. Uh, Sandra, don't uh, get relaxed at the same tempo. You please continue uh, till uh, the issue of certificates. Yes, yes, yes. No, yes, yes, we, uh, no uh, that is a Herculean task, right? Yes. Yes. Conducting lectures yes. is very easier than uh, issuing certificates. And the two more certificates you create in such a way that uh, both of you are coordinators. Okay, sure, okay. Sure, sure. Okay, ma'am. I think we can continue. Thank you very much, ma'am. And finally, I, I I say a whole lot, a big love, both of you. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So I'll end.